Welcome to We Can Be. I'm Janet Sarbaugh, the Vice President of Creativity Programs at the Heinz Endowments, and I'll be your host for today's episode. In this conversation, we're going to tackle one of those big questions. Are the arts an essential part of our society? And if so, how and why? Today's guest is uniquely qualified to dive into that question. Jeffrey Brown is the Chief Correspondent for Arts, Culture, and Society at PBS NewsHour. In his over 20 years with PBS NewsHour, he's reported on a wide range of national and international art and culture-related issues. He created PBS NewsHour's online Art Beat segments and their monthly book club, Now Read This, a collaboration with the New York Times. He's also a talented creative in his own right, having authored the wonderful poetry collection The News and contributed to a newly released collection of essays titled Are the Arts Essential? Song of the News. What do we see and what do we say? Between what happened and who cares? Between give a damn and what the hell? Between good evening and good day? Car crash, caress, the children at play. All that we see and all that we say. That's me thinking about what the hell is the news, you know, and, you know, there's so many things that go on in any one day. We're doing an hour-long program. I've done this, you know, for more than 30 years where we gather and we make a decision in an editorial meeting about what are we going to put on that program every night. What's important? How do we do it? What do we want to say today? Jeffrey Brown, there's so much that I want to ask you about your work at PPS NewsHour, but first I want to start with what brought you to Pittsburgh and made this podcast possible. You're a contributor to a new book titled Are the Arts Essential? Mm -hmm. And in your essay in the book, you beautifully outline the connection that you see between journalism and the arts. The essence of it, I think, is that you say that the arts help us know our world better. Can you talk a bit about your evolution and coming to believe that? Are the arts essential? Of course, the answer is yes. It's been essential and a core value for me as a journalist and as a person forever. My journalism has always been grounded on a sense of, um, you know, what's important, what do we value in addition to what's happening. And so the arts were always, if not front and center in the news, they were part of what I was leaning on and part of what I was thinking about at a certain point, and in some stories, of course, it is exactly what I'm reporting on. But my core sense that what artists and what writers are doing, in part, is telling the news, if you have an expanded sense of what the news is, which in my mind is who we are and what's going on in the world. In your essay, you talk about telling stories, and you say that your job is to tell stories about artist stories. Mm -hmm. Could you share something, an experience, or a story from an artist or an organization that you've worked on on the NewsHour that particularly was moving or meaningful to you? Well, that's a tough one, because there's about 30 years of them. So, (laughs) you know, some of the most meaningful to me over time have been in places in this country and abroad where journalists typically go and we tell stories that you might expect to hear if you if we go to um, places around the world where the typical news story might be about a disaster or war or famine or poverty we do that of course but we also have been able to look at the world through artists through writers, through musicians, as they kind of look at and explain their world. And for me, it's been an uh, incredibly fulfilling way to sort of see the world and hopefully convey what I'm seeing to our audience, a different window into the world. You know, going to the Middle East for what for many of us is, you know, decades of uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But Um, Rather than talking to the generals or the politicians, although we do that too, talking to poets and artists 
or going to a place like Haiti after, you know, the earthquake, talking to artists who were putting the, what was happening into a larger focus, a larger context. And I've always thought that was an important way into understanding what's going on. You've written about how the Dallas Street Choir provides a bridge for the public not only to appreciate music, but also to consider serious societal issues. Can you share some of the experiences you had with that group? In Dallas, Jonathan Plant is a uh, singer himself and a choral director started the uh, Dallas Street Choir, he thought he wanted to take this to the streets. And he works with a shelter once a week, maybe twice, where people can come. They get some food, and they get a place to hang out for a while and do something that gives them a sense of community through singing. Some of them have sung before, most of them have not. It was, um, you know, remarkable to see um, the commitment with which they came, the passion with, with which they were singing. Jonathan, as I've seen with other people who do this kind of thing, treated them the same as he would treat professional singers, with utter respect, you know, for their time and for their giving. We got to talk to him, of course, and we got to talk to um, several of the um, people who had come to sing. So for us, it becomes a way to understand, through Jonathan, the role of uh, music in a new way. It also becomes a way for us to explore the problem of homelessness. It sounds like you have a philosophy that is, well, it's really a broad view of the value of the artist's voice in telling about the world. Do you think that artists have to be directly addressing social issues to add value to our understanding of the news or culture? No, I don't. You know, that's one of the things that many artists do. You know, we're a news program, so I'm always thinking about What's the arts or culture story that belong in a news program, right? And how do I connect it to issues that we might be covering in the rest of the program? Health or the environment or conflict or climate change or all kinds of things. So, yes, we're often looking to artists and writers who are addressing these things through their work. And I find that incredibly valuable, and I know audiences do. And that's often a good way in for us to capture those kind of stories. But I don't personally feel that artists have to feel they have that responsibility. I don't require that of them. And I think they can do their work, and their work often has many different kinds of focuses. Sometimes it is directly relevant to the news. Other times it's not. Is there a famous artist that you've done a story on that you were particularly giddy or excited to meet, interact with? You know, I I was a young sort of um, rock and roll kid growing up, and I used to love um, Patti Smith. You know, for those of us who grew up listening to you and thinking of you as rock and roller, this love of books was there first, I guess. Oh, absolutely. I evolved with my band in rock and roll through poetry. Mm not through music. I love books, I, and I love what the hand of mankind uh, produces, whether painting or music, opera. I just think it's wonderful that we have that in our life. She walked into our studio, she looked around and she said, so this is where you do it. And I realized that Patti Smith watches the news hour, you know, and I thought, that's that's pretty cool. She was the rock poet goddess, you know, for me growing up. Uh, I thought that kind of thing was very cool. I've, I've met many uh, and interviewed many um, 
I guess what you'd call celebrities. We, we don't go after them. We're in a kind of funny category. I often interview celebrity like actors for projects that aren't maybe like their most popular, like the big mega plex type movies, but projects that are extremely important to them. And I love that because they're totally invested in it. I, I also remember a funny story with Angelina Jolie, for example. She called us, I mean, her people called us and said, she'll be in Washington uh, next Tuesday. Would you like to interview her? And kind of went, well, uh, I guess so. You know, what, 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 about what, you know? Well, she had directed a very serious movie about the war in Bosnia because it was a very important issue for her. And uh, we said yes immediately because, well, it was Angelina Jolie, but also it was this issue that we had covered again on the program. And this was an interesting way into it of, a, of an artist looking at that and kind of looking back at that. You know, this is harrowing and powerful, but not a fun or easy night at the movies, right? I know these are hard films to watch. I mean, they're the films I like to watch, but because at the end of the day, I think people innately want to be responsible. We want to know what's happening around us. We want to be a part of the world, be in the world and of the world. And um, what it is, it's, it's still a movie. It's not even real, and it's as, as upsetting as it is. So it forces people where, you know, to, to wonder what it must have really been like. To interview Angelina Jolie, we were told she would be at a certain hotel. We should arrive at a certain time. We arrived. We were taken to a kind of holding room. We were giving, given very careful instructions. You know, in 10 minutes, you will be taken to this room, and then you will be taken to the room for the interview. No photographs will be allowed. It was all very so sort of formal and um, unusual, you know, almost like a security type thing, right? We went in. Oh, and, and we were told you will be given, you know, eight minutes. And, you know, <laughs> so it was all kind of funny to us, just how, how strict they were about it. Anyway, we went and did it. It was all fine. Two days after talking to Angelina Jolie, I went to the Pentagon to talk to Secretary of Defense, who was Leon Panetta at the time. You would think that the Pentagon would have slightly more security than, you know, visiting Angelina Jolie. And they do have pretty good security. But it was almost easier to get in to meet Leon Panetta than to talk to Angelina Jolie. And when I arrived, because I'd known him over some years and been covering him since he was a congressman, it was, hey, Jeff, you know, nice to see you. Come on and sit down. Let's take a picture together, you know. It's just clear from talking to you and from knowing your work for many years that you almost have a calling to this work in arts journalism. And I think people who are listening might be surprised to know that at one point in graduate school, you were actually on a dual track of journalism and law. What attracted you uh, back over to the journalism side? Yeah, I appreciate you doing your homework and checking and reading about that. But actually, the more interesting uh, decision was prior to that. The dual track was not so much uh, journalism and law. Um, the more interesting um, decision for me was between the past and the present, or then and now. I really got into classics, ancient Greek, and that was my undergraduate degree in uh, and I loved it in, in many ways, and I applied to graduate school and was accepted and was about to start. I don't know exactly what happened, but I decided I did not want to live in the 5th or 4th century B.C. I decided that, that I wanted to be more in the contemporary world of today. Journalism I, was something I hadn't even thought of till then, so I came to it a little later than most people, actually. I worked for one paper, and this was in the San Francisco Bay Area weekly paper, the San Francisco Bay Guardian. I got started doing the listings, and then I started doing little stories, and I realized I liked it. Law school was, for me, um, never to practice law, so that's it wasn't that kind of a decision. I, I actually sort of concocted something, a joint degree program between journalism and law. My goal as a journalist originally was to be a legal journalist. I aspired to nothing less than the uh, Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times, something like that. I went to the law school at Berkeley, where I was an undergraduate, and the journalism school at Columbia. And the idea was to do it all in, I think it was three and a half years. I did my two years of law school, first two years. I came to New York and did my one year for a master's in journalism at Columbia. I was supposed to go finish law school. I never did. 
I just started working, and I loved what I was doing. Went to the news hour fairly quickly after a couple of years, and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. I think I speak for a lot of people who love the arts to say that we're glad you're where you are. There are a lot of people who work in and love the arts who like to wring our hands about the state of arts journalism in the mm. country and the world. Not just cultural criticism, but cultural commentary. And so your being there and doing what you're mm. doing is, is a precious thing. Thank you. You were named arts correspondent in 2002, and you started arts be- in 2008, did it take a lot of convincing, or was there a natural evolution in the organization of understanding the importance of culture as you know, not a frill? No, it didn't take a lot of convincing, but I early on had nothing to do with it. I was actually hired in, in the way of journalism. You know, you're, you're hired into a job. I mean, I was first an uh, economics reporter, I knew, which was an off-air, by the way, a producer. I knew nothing about economics, but they saw something in me and brought me, this was, this was the opening at the organization, so I did it. And then, you know, in a small organization, I quickly sort of found little places where I could uh, move around and take on other things. Well, arts was something there at a certain point to be taken and expanded. And I, when I got a chance, I took it under my wing first as a producer, you know, in our morning meetings, helping decide what would be on the day's program. So I guess if I take credit for something around that time, it would be to try to give the arts more of a regular place on the program. And did it take convincing? No. I mean, Jim Lair, you know, he said, go, go, take it on. But uh, the joke was, take it on, but while you did your, your main job. You know, I was doing many other things, and it was a very much of a sidelight. When, as you say, I was sort of named arts correspondent, that was a kind of part-time job. I had not been even on television at that time. I, I did something that's quite unusual in our industry, and maybe in, you know, in many industries or jobs where you get to switch what you do. So I had been behind the camera for many years, and then I went on camera part-time, sort of an experiment, to do art stories. And I, it went on for a number of years as a part-time thing, where I was both kind of overseeing it as the producer and doing many of the stories as a correspondent. And it grew from there. I mean, from there, when I became a correspondent, it was then a general correspondent. And then it was Jim Lair always saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Come into the studio. Now you'll be one of our regular you know, you're you're a moderator, and then it was a uh, you're now you're going to be a, an anchor. Uh, so it was like nightly, 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 nightly. It's the nightly news. It's you're doing whatever has to be done. Different story every night. Different interviews every night. And I kept holding on to the arts hat as much as I could. Some of that was even just sort of my own, you know, weekends, or I'd be writing those stories at night, after hours. And it wasn't until later on that I had the opportunity to really um, take it on the way I do now as a a full-time, pretty much full-time thing. Is there any advice you'd give to local news outlets or journalists who are interested in doing this kind of work that don't have the incredible friends in court like Robert McNeil or Jim Lehrer, what they should do to try to push this agenda within institutions that maybe are less sympathetic? I'm not so good at advice because the world has changed so much. You know, the world of arts journalism has, of course, changed in many ways for the worse, but also for the better in some ways. If you think about the traditional media, like newspapers, local news, that hole for arts coverage has shrunk, as has, you know, the hole for so many other kinds of coverage in a sad way. And there are very few papers where there is a very vibrant arts coverage. And I think, and this goes way beyond arts coverage, but we all understand that local news coverage is a major problem in the country. So many places that do not have the resources and so many stories at the local level are not being covered. There are many wonderful initiatives to try to change that, and that's a kind of exciting thing happening in the world of journalism. So that's had an impact on arts journalism, of course. On the other hand, Social media, podcasts, like the kind of thing we're doing right now, have changed the world as well. Um, So that uh, in arts journalism, there are 
oh my goodness, you know, whatever your interest is, books or music or whatever, um, you can find a zillion podcasts and uh, uh, websites that address these things. So it's there, I guess, one of the big differences, but this, again, goes to a big difference in the world of journalism generally, is that these are all smaller niches. The mass journalism that I grew up with, for example, three major networks, CNN was just starting. There wasn't an internet. That mass journalism, mass media, is no more. It's much more of a divided media world. And so that's had an impact on arts journalism. So the advice has to be that you have to look for the right niche that you can fit into and see how you grow from there. When you've described your own journey in the arts, it's clear that poetry is a big influence. And I'm going to quote you here. Poetry, in fact, came first for me, a first accounting of what it means to be alive in this world. Journalism comes later. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you remember or could say something about what some of the early poems and works of literature that you still think about and that might have guided you toward that interest in poetry as a way of understanding the world. So I was reading poetry and I was reading fiction before I had any thought of being in journalism. So I was always thinking about language and literature as ways of looking at the world and ways of writing it down, you know, and, and of telling it. When I was studying classics, I was reading Homer, and I was even reading Homer in Greek at a certain time. And um, what was Homer doing but, you know, sort of telling the history, in a way, of a people? I mean, it was an oral tradition. That's how people told history. So I was always interested in a, a poetry that addressed history. Uh, The modernists, uh, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, these people were important to me at a certain time. And on up to, you know, today where people are looking very much at uh, social issues and uh, our own history through poetry. So what was interesting for me getting to my own writing of poetry was when I kind of flipped things a little bit and started writing poetry that was based on the journalism. So I guess guess thinking about the order you've asked, it would be poetry and then journalism, and then kind of combining them in a way I hadn't expected. And that's why I even had fun with the name of the book I published called The News. Well, it's important to say, too, that you're a published poet and that your collection, The News, has a wonderful feature where it includes a notation for every poem that states the part of the world that inspired its creation. I wondered if we could talk you into reading one of those poems. Sure. One is from a trip I made to um, Haiti. One of the things about television journalism is that if the camera doesn't capture it, it didn't happen. You know, I mean, obviously that's not true. It happened. (laughs) But for me as a television journalist, if the camera didn't capture it, how can I convey it? So this was an encounter with a woman uh, who I just loved it. I don't know her name. You know, I know nothing about her. But she kind of turned the tables on me. It's uh, called Haiti Casite, which was a little village where this encounter happened. Haiti Casite. We who lie, who cannot say, for there is no good way to put this, we are here to show the horror of your life. In Casite, they passed out purification tablets, displayed with pride their new latrine. A woman sweeping her dusty steps, asked to act naturally for the camera, to act as though we're not here. More honest and aware than us, replied, How can I pretend that you are not here? Was that not you who spoke just now? So, you know, this is, this is us going to a place, swooping in, trying to capture a little bit of a life. Things were very bad in this place. And this is just us encountering a woman who was sweeping her steps and trying to live a life. The cameraman said, just sweep, don't have to look at us. And she actually said that, or a version of that, you know. How can I not, how can, 
Didn't you just ask me? To, <laughs> how can I pretend you're not here? <laughs> Beyond your own reporting, what or who do you listen to when, the, when you're in the car by yourself? And what artists, writers, performers are exciting you now? Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, you know, funny now, I'm not, I live in New York City again for the first time after about 20 years away, and I'm not in the car, so I'm not listening anymore. <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing you ask because, no, I've been thinking about that myself. I've been listening to a lot less. I, I have a very eclectic musical tastes. I kind of grew up a rock and roll kid, so I, I will listen to a fair amount of older and newer rock. I love classical music. When in doubt, I'll put on a Beethoven or Bach. I love a lot of jazz. I, I listen to a lot of jazz. I love a lot of jazz. I play the piano a bit, uh, and I love a lot of jazz piano. I love you know, I mean, folk music, I love bluegrass music, I love a lot of modern-day bluegrass. I, I happen to be someone who reads a lot, uh, I travel a lot, you know, uh, around the country and around the world. I love to read the, the fiction and the poetry of places I'm going. It, it's what I love to do as a, as a person, as a traveler. So whether I'm going for work or pleasure, I read where I'm going, and I also read into the news. So... Lately, I've been reading Ukrainian novelists, and uh, you want to read a great writer? Sergei Zhadan. It's Z-H-A-D-A-N. He's from eastern Ukraine, and um, he's a poet and novelist, and um, these books are available. I've been telling people about, uh, I had read it a few years ago, but it's now getting a lot of attention because of Ukraine, but Ilya Kaminsky's Deaf Republic, another profound uh, you know, sort of fairy tale told in uh, poetry. Well, with with that, those kinds of eclectic interests, they come through on the news hour in a wonderful way. So, uh, listeners, if you're like me, okay, I'm going to go out and remind myself about Merle Fest and look at the Ukrainian writers and go back to my Terrence Hayes. Um, you know, everybody should um, have those kinds of eclectic interests and. Um, that's just they're, they're just that's just a wonderful uh, recitation and set of recommendations for us. So my last question is, and I think this question has been asked of all our podcast interviewees over years. The name of this podcast is "We Can Be." What do you think we, as a community, country, and world, can be? To me, the "we" is the important word. Who is we? That's what I would ask. I just had an interesting experience about a week or two ago. I interviewed John Baptiste. One of the songs from the last couple of years of his that big hit was um, a We Are, which was a, became an anthem he wrote for the Black Lives Matter movement. I asked him, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a news perspective here, and we're reporting on the world every night, and in a divided America, who's we? I don't hear a lot of people talking about we. Do you think there's a we? In schools, hospitals, community centers across the country, there's a lot of we. In this global understanding of our world and in this age of media, we've lost touch with the community and we've lost touch with our localized thinking, our understanding of each other from a human to human perspective. And what I see is there's a lot of good that goes unnoticed and there's a lot that can be more so when you ask who can we be i think the emphasis first has to be that we all have to see a we and find our way to we even if that means you know um spending a lot of time with our within our own communities it means a kind of tolerance or at least a curiosity about the other and others in our community so that so that we maintain a kind of we and that's a we for our local community for our city for our state and for our country and then for our world and that's a consummate artist's answer how can we find a way to we without artists helping us find that way amen <laughs>